Hello, St. James. It's good to be with you on this, the last Sunday of Epiphany, Transfiguration Sunday. And it was wonderful to be with you last Sunday at our annual meeting. It was the largest collection of St. James uh, faces that I have seen since the beginning of this uh, COVID season. Uh, and it really uh, didn't ju just up uplift me in the moment, but it was a, a wonderful foreshadowing of, um, of reunions to come. So thank you all. Uh, and thanks to our uh, faithful vestry who've served there three years and to those newly elected uh, and to Bob for pulling it all together and I did want to clarify one thing about the annual meeting uh, we talked about the budget uh, and in doing so we mentioned that we would uh, fully fund uh, church for operations in September that was uh, for budgetary purposes we will reopen uh, whether it's regathering outside or uh, slowly uh, making our way back into this worship space as soon as um, it is safe and we have permission and we already have approval of our regathering plan and we anticipate that being well before September so I just uh, didn't want that uh, that date to get locked in uh, or to discourage you. Uh, also, uh, for those uh, who are really having a difficult time right now, and I realize uh, as this uh, goes on uh, almost a year now, and as we're also in the, uh, the throes of winter, uh, it can be very discouraging, and uh, you are not alone. Uh, and to that end, our, adult, uh, our pastoral care team uh, wants you to know they are there. Uh, if you need somebody to walk with you, uh, to, to be on the other uh, side of a phone call, uh, to pray for you, please don't hesitate to reach out and you can see how to reach out um, in the weekly news. Uh, also, this coming week uh, marks the beginning of Lent. This Tuesday would have been our Mardi Gras celebration, our Shrove Tuesday. Uh, and then on Wednesday, uh, we celebrate Ash Wednesday and we'll do so virtually this year. Uh, but we encourage you uh, to not just watch the virtual service, uh, but to consider having a an Ash Wednesday service at home, maybe have ashes already prepared. And um, our tradition is generally to have them from previous year's palms, or we order them uh, and they ha have been pre previously made from palms, but it does not have to be from palms. You can take ashes uh, from a fireplace or a fire pit or, um, or however you're able to make ashes uh, for the, the ritual of the imposition of ashes. And it does not require a priest either. So we will guide you uh, through that, uh, but it uh, hopefully will be a good start to, uh, uh, to a rich Lenten journey. I also realize this Lent, you may not be feeling like taking one more thing out of your lives. You may feel like you've already been stripped uh, fairly bare, uh, and uh, tightening your relationship with God may not require uh, giving up sweets or, 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 or anything else that you might have given up in years past. Uh, maybe it's taking something on that helps you grow uh, in confidence and in hope that God is at the helm uh, and that the journey is not just to the cross, uh, but to that empty tomb on the other side, that hope-filled mor Easter morning. Uh, maybe it's girding ourselves uh, for the hope of a, a, of a time after COVID is well behind us. Uh, whatever it is you need, I hope that you're intentional about this, this Lenten time. Uh, and to that end, we are offering a weekly devotion of which you can uh, both uh, receive daily uh, and participate in. It will be uh, reflections from me and from Bishop Ted and from others in the church and possibly from you if you feel called. Uh, you can see that information in the weekly as well. Uh, also, our adult formation committee is reading a classic, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Uh, you can participate in that, uh, and you can read along with us even if you aren't able to participate on Sunday morning. And finally, uh, Jen Taylor has put together two-go Lenten kits uh, for families, and those will be available at the entrance, uh, under the awning at the, en at the school entrance. Uh, and if you don't find it there, you can certainly coordinate with her to get your uh, Lenten pack, uh, but it's a... Uh, uh, a bag of, uh, of different uh, activities and ways that you all can walk through this season together. And if there's anything I can do uh, to help make this a more meaningful, impactful Lent, uh, a more sustaining uh, season, a more hope-filled season, uh, please, uh, please reach out to me as well. And with that, we begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. From the Battaglia family to the St. James family, we miss you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Prayers of the People I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the Church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Joseph, our President, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or fear discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us toward sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially Linda, Lloyd, Maggie, Becky, Ellsworth, Paula, Ruby, Tom, Pat, Ansel, Patty, Tina, Kay, and Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and any whom we now name, either silently or aloud. For Kristen and for Jacob. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Thank you for the growing availability of vaccines. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. 
During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly they looked around. They saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Word of the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the fire and burn. Come as light reveal. Come as the wind and calm. Convince, convict, convert us until we are wholly yours. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A little over a year ago in those good old days when you could let your grandchildren come into your house, my seven-year-old granddaughter was flipping through our 50-year-old wedding album with what appeared to be a kind of creeping incredulity. How could that beautiful bride and that boyish-looking kid in a tuxedo be in any way related to the old coot sitting next to her? Looking at the album with her, I was facing a similar uh, incredulity. Boy, time changes everything, and in such dramatic ways. You know, there is truth in a wed wedding album. Ted and Barbara were very young. They were surrounded by nurturing family and a host of friends. All of this is true. You could tell that they delighted in each other's very being. The wedding was, the wedding photograph was a glimpse, a very brief glimpse of a beginning. The wedding pictures depict a certain truth. However, the album doesn't tell the whole truth. It gives you a glimpse of a wedding, but tells you very little about a marriage. You cannot know the story of the marriage by studying the initial glimpse. I think the same point can be made and in a sense must be made about Mark's story of the transfiguration, today's gospel reading. In verses prior to today's reading, to the account of the most famous mountaintop experience that ever occurred, in the prior verses, Jesus has called his followers to risk their lives and follow him. If you're not willing to lose your life, you can't save it. And, but on the mountain, with Peter and James and John, the demand, the consuming demand, is contextualized in a very important way. 
giving up one's life or surrendering one's life is a demand that is given in a context. The larger context is the authority, the shared glory, and the revelation that time itself is not constrained by chronology, but is open-ended. What do I mean by that? Listen to the story. Moses and Elijah are present on the mountain. They are present in this moment. God's time is not constrained by chronology. Yes, Moses and Elijah are no more chronologically, but in God's time, in God's being, in God's being where death is not a problem, Moses and Elijah are right there. And... They are there with one who is revealed as beloved son and the God whose son is Jesus. This God seems so generous with glory. Glory isn't just God's property. Glory is something that God seems to delight in sharing with a beloved son with Peter, with James, John, with Moses, with Elijah. Glory is shared. (coughs) Jesus is revealed in glory, but glory, glory terrifying and true is not reserved for deity, but it is shared. Peter and James and John are also glorified on that mountain. Their proximity to God's glory begins as terror, but will in fact mature. Their experience of glory on that mountain will mature to a pervasive confidence. A confidence that will see Jesus through his harrowing death and will see Peter and James and John confident as they proclaim the story of his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. My sisters and my brothers, Lent is just around the corner. It will be a very, very strange and atypical Lent, but it's right around the corner. We are about to begin that most introspective of seasons, But I think that we must embrace Lent in the context of the generous glory that will be our destiny and is our baptismal birthright. What will Lent be like if we focused on glory and not just our sin? When I was a very new bishop, I was required to participate in a three-year leadership development program. In this program, we were introduced to transformative leaders, one of whom turned out to be our fellow Episcopalian. Some of you know of him. Some of you have actually used his products. The person I'm referring to is Tom, who is the owner and CEO of Tom's of Maine. Toothpaste and self-care products that are made to be environmentally tender and good for the consumer. Tom said something that I will never forget. He said that the governing principles of his corporation, Tom's of Maine, was the baptismal covenant of the Book of Common Prayer. And one of the things that he shared with us is that every year there is no dividend paid to stockholders, nor is there a raise for any of the family members unless every employee has been given a raise. 
if there can be no raise for employees, that means there is no uh, dividend for shareholders, nor is there a raise for the principal owners. To explain why, he told us a family story. It seems that his grandfather was traveling on a Pullman car, taking a train trip, and his grandfather noticed that the brass fixtures in the Pullman car were polished to a very high sheen. As the porter moved through the car, Tom's grandfather complimented him on his diligence and said, these fixtures are just gleaming. They're so beautiful, you maintain them beautifully. And after a pause, the conductor looked Tom's grandfather in the eye and said, every man needs his glory. Every man needs his glory. What if that could be our focus for Lent? To rediscover that like Peter and James and John, we too, through our baptism, through God's delight in us as beloved, through God's trust in us, to continue to tell the story and to live the good news in our various places and circumstances, could we dare believe that what Lent is mostly about is the reclaiming of the glory that is our gift and our destiny because the God we know in Jesus is a God who wants to glorify not only his Son, but all who live in his son. The transfiguration is a glimpse of glory. It teaches us wonderful things, but it does not teach us everything. We see Jesus in dazzling garments, but we do not see him drenched in blood from a painful crown of thorns. We do not see spit caked on his face. We do not see sweat pouring off of his naked and exposed body on the hard wood. We get a glimpse, but like a wedding photograph, it is certainly not the whole story. The God who glorifies us is the God of compassion, relentless compassion, who will do anything to be with us in all of life's circumstances, in our joys and in our sorrows in our health and in our sickness. And this God who glorifies us cannot and will not ever lose us even in time. Time, like death, is not God's problem. Moses and Elijah are there. And we are held in a loving embrace that desires to give us glory and will not ever lose us. So, we have to listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Listen to him and move down the mountain with him this Lent and accompany him as he does his ministry of glorification as each person he meets is transfigured and given a new perspective on their life. May we join him in this ministry of glorification as we engage all of those that we are called to serve realizing that they are, like we are, glorious. Amen.
Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.